Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Weston. I'm the Executive Director of Actera Action for a Healthy Planet. So um, while we have the behind the scenes stuff going on, we are, again, closing out our series for the spring 2021. I'm welcoming you here. Super excited to have you. We've had a great series over the course of the spring. Uh, in February, we welcomed our own board member, Bruce Hodge. Uh, he spoke about mass beneficial electrification. And then in March, we had uh, Regina Wallace-Jones, former mayor of East Palo Alto, talk about little cities doing big things. And then in April, Julia Zeitlin spoke about uh, the Sunrise Movement and her work as a youth activist. And now we get to welcome Nitesh Dalab, who has um, done quite a bit of work with Actera previously. And we're excited to hear more about his work on sustainable development goals. Actera, of course, focuses on our public outreach and education. We do this in a couple of ways. One is through this public lecture series, and one is through our brand new and um, as of January launched Youth Be the Change program. We're excited to be welcoming students into our uh, Youth Be the Change climate change curricula. We're serving middle school students, and we're excited to be able to continue that over the summer and into the school year. A huge thanks to our series underwriters, Mary and Clinton Gilliland and Armand and Elian Newkermans. They are um, huge supporters of our lectures and we couldn't do this without them. We're incredibly grateful for their continued support. And of course, as always, our amazing series sponsors, Bay Area Air Quality Management District and The Foster. When we were holding lectures in person pre-pandemic, The Foster was an amazing home for our lectures and um, we're so thankful for their continued support. Some upcoming workshops that we have, please join us June 9th for a GoV, Go EV workshop. Uh, we're gonna be teaching the basics of EV ownership, including the benefits of all types of EVs, the rebates available for them, current makes and models, and of course, what's in store for the future. Please register through our website if you're interested in that event. Go to actera.org slash events. And then a second EV event that we have is Think You Can't Afford an EV, Think Again. This will be held June 16th. And um, we're really excited to be presenting these EV programs and uh, hope that you'll join us. And as I'm waiting for Nitesh, I'm just gonna leave this bio up for him. I am thrilled to welcome Nitesh Dalab, who has been focused on sustainability and socioeconomic businesses in the public and private sector for many years. He joined South Africa's Department of Trade and Industry and served as South Africa's economic attache in Beijing and Shanghai for almost four years. His interests in environmental, social, and governance issues, ESG, or corporate social responsibility, CSR, has continued as he led teams of professionals in a provincial government agency in South Africa. In the US, Natesh has been involved in a number of startups. He was VP of shared services of a finance company that focused on alternative asset classes, here, his work supported sales, marketing, compliance, and business development. This led him to another fintech startup that focused on developing an online platform for SBA loans. His interest in ESG and CSR then focused on water, wastewater, energy, and health projects with a large energy drink company. He also completed a pilot study on indirect potable reuse with Stanford, the city of Palo Alto, and a few consulting firms. Natesh has now been involved in implementing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, and the ESG roadmaps. He has worked with local and international companies, assisting them in prioritizing the SDG goals and developing ESG-specific programs. Natesh has a public administration degree with majors in public admin, political science, and industrial psychology. He completed an honors and master's degree in international relations from Rhodes University in South Africa, and an MBA from Henley Management College, now University of Reading in the UK. Natesh also recently completed the accredited Center for Sustainability and Excellence Advanced Certified Sustainability Practitioner Program in San Francisco. He's currently studying at the Thought Leaders Business School in Australia and is a board member of a nonprofit in Palo Alto. His most notable leadership award was the Archbishop Tutu Fellowship Award that focused on diversity and good governments. Thank you so much again and welcome Natesh. There we go. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. Sorry, sorry about that, Lauren. <laughs> Some real technology issues this more this afternoon. Probably it's saying it's it's late afternoon. You need to have your tea and coffee and go to bed, maybe. 
<laughs> yes, yes, I completely agree. Well, I'm thrilled to have you. Thank you all for those that are attending for your patience as Thank we you. work through this. Um, Nitesh, I uh, firstly am just so grateful to you for joining us again. I don't know for some of you that participated, but Nitesh joined me in one of my monthly coffee chats. Um, and I met him many, many months ago over a conversation about water conservation. So Nitesh has a long history that I have learned a tremendous amount from, and I am thrilled to turn this over to you. So you have screen sharing capacity. You're welcome to, to share, and um, I will facilitate questions. Please remember you can ask questions in the Q&A, raise your hand, and I will facilitate those at the end of the lecture. Nitesh, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you for bearing with me with my technology issues today. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can share my screen firstly. Can everybody see my screen there? Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. You're good. All right. Is that better? Okay. Yep, that's full screen. There you go. All right, Lauren, firstly, thank you to you and to Actera for giving me an opportunity today to uh, talk briefly about sustainability. But more importantly, I think um, just to get a, I would say from, from my side, to give a better understanding in terms of the, the growth and the importance of ESG and sustainability and how this is actually accelerating organizational performance, um, you know, with a, with a very strong purpose and, and impact in mind as well. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, you can see my slides, right, Lauren? Yes, you're good. Okay, all right, thanks. So folks, what I would like to do today, you know, as part of the discussion is to go through a few areas. I wanted to firstly talk about uh, what are the UN SDGs and, and specifically issues around ESG. Then wanted to talk briefly about what are some of the global trends around SDG and ESG. Um, but then also try and identify those very specific ESG criteria to improve sustainability. And we'd look and we will look at a few global matrix matrix out there. And then wanted to just share an organizational or organizational performance case study and look at some of the ESG due diligence, you know, as part of this. And then lastly, what are, what is a roadmap in terms of um, growing the understanding, but more importantly, also the awareness around ESG uh, within a organizational setting. And then, uh, you know, have some conclusions and, you know, and, and really looking forward to the discussions uh, and the questions uh, following, following this. So let's start with this very quickly. What are the UN SDGs? So I'm sure many of you have, have heard of the UN SDGs and you're familiar with them in terms of who they are and, and what they represent. But, but basically, you know, they have been set up in 2015. They're a set of 17 goals that have been set by the UN um, with 169 targets. Um, so it might seem complex, but there's, for me personally, there's been a lot of meaning, you know, in terms of understanding sustainability from this very broad framework of sustainability and we talk briefly about the 17 goals as well. But in many respects, these 17 SDGs are, are universal in their nature. They, they have formed a very strong integrative way of understanding sustainability in my view. And I think the most important thing is that by having an agenda, specifically a 2030 agenda, they have become very transformational and instrumental in bringing about a sustainability change, I think, um, both for the public sector, the private sector, but also for communities at large. And these are the 17 SDGs, you know. Um, you will see that in each of those particular 17 SDGs, there is a very strong relationship to, I would say, huge environmental issues, uh, huge economic issues, social issues, but also it covers areas around governmental issues, but, but also looking at uh, specific areas around, around, around corporation. 
Um, you know, my personal favorite year is SDG six, water and sanitation. That's an area that I've been focusing on, as as Lauren has indicated, but also on um, SDG seventeen, global partnerships, because I think you know, in order to achieve these seventeen SDGs, there needs to be a strong collaboration with with both the public sector and the private sector to achieve these 17 SDGs. So when I talk about the SDGs and the growth of sustainability, I also want us to understand that this has been a transition, that there has been a growth in terms of what's been happening in the sustainability space. And, and in this slide, you will see you know, the, the growth of the investor coalitions, but more importantly, also the growth of the networks that have been happening um, around this particular sustainability space. And you'll see, you know, institutions, for example, like CDP, uh, Carbon Disclosure Project, Principles for Responsible Investing or Investment, and TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. You know, these are institutions that are to some extent shaping our landscape as well. And by shaping this particular landscape, there are now a plethora of frameworks and guidelines and standards that have been developed. So in the corporate space, you will see that many companies are starting to look at something called GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, whereby they are starting to, to disclose more of their sustainability initiatives through the GRI or through CDP or integrated reporting. Um, and in some cases, um, a lot of institutions are now also looking at PRI and DCFD. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals has been an important part of this particular disclosure. And some companies are also looking at Global Compact and the 10 principles in Global Compact and reporting against those uh, guidelines as well. So, you will see that sustainability has been on a journey and that and that journey i think is con is in my view going to be growing even even further in the next decade as companies and institutions are looking at their 2030 goals now this is a bit of a busy slide but i think an important slide because we're talking about this growth of this esg ecosystem and within this growth of the ESG ecosystem, you will see on your extreme left, you will see the organizations that have been providing or that are working towards creating these new frameworks. But then at the same time, you will see also some of the other institutions, um, for example, like CDP or Just Capital or Ecovados that are providing, I would say, in many cases, this robust way or this robust uh, understanding an assessment for companies to start looking at how are they reporting on their sustainability uh, issues. Um, the, I want to bring your direction or your attention to the center of uh, uh, this particular slide. And you'll see that over the last 10 to 15 years, there has also been a growth of numerous rating and rating uh, and sorry, rating and rating uh, rating and ranking agencies out there, you know, and just to name a few: sustainability, uh, sustainalytics, sorry, uh, MSCI, TrueCost, Bloomberg, you know. So there's a there's been a huge growth in in this level of um, of rating and and reporting as well. And in some cases, uh, what you are also seeing is that um, companies are starting to look at Fortune 100 uh, best companies and they're looking at, uh, I would say, what are some of the best practices uh, emanating from a disclosure perspective? So this is, this, this particular ecosystem, as I say, would be growing in the next five to 10 years as well. Again, a very busy slide, but I think it's important to understand that the ESG merger and acquisition space is growing. And you will see again by some of the rating and ranking agencies and the acquisitions that they're making, some of the new disclosure requirements that are starting to take place, um, but also some of the announcements that have been made, for example, by some of these large global 
agencies like SNB, uh, like SNB Global, you know, as well. And what I am seeing that is coming out of that is that they are putting, so there seems to be a lot of investor pressure already and community pressure in terms of what are you doing to disclose your materiality issues? How are you, how are you doing that? You know, what are some of the steps, the processes that you are putting in place to, to make sure that there's uh, efficient and effective disclosure uh, within the organization as well. So again, just wanted to point out that this particular space or this M&A space is growing. So I just wanted to conclude this section very quickly by saying that, 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 there, that there has been an evolution of sustainability. And you will see that that particular evolution has, has moved up from, from being a simple philanthropic endeavor to a corporate social responsibility endeavor to now actually integrating sustainability and sustainability strategy within the organization and then having a strong governance, you know, um, specifically at a board level and now moving into a fiduciary duty whereby you know, a lot of companies are reporting this as part of the 10K. And um, we were on a call today with some members of the, uh, from the SSC. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's going to be further disclosure that's going to be required, you know, either through your 10K or either through your sustainability report, you know, in terms of how, how are you providing that landscape of ESG disclosure? So, I sort of wanted to transcend to, to the next point and taking into account um, what are some of the most important trends out there. And um, ERM, the company uh, of which I'm a partner with uh, at the moment has a sustainability institute called Sustainability. And they on a yearly basis put together a trends report. And for this year, they've put together this, this particular trends report in, in terms of saying, what are those most important trends out there? And, that are, and what are those trends that are actually dominating the ESG space? So you will see that there has been a collage of different and most important trends out there. And I think for me, Personally, I want to just focus on three, you know, integrating as uh, ESG, valuing human capital and responding to, to climate change. Not to say, uh, you know, that all of the others are not important, but I think what I'm seeing at the moment is that there seems to be a plethora of new work that is currently happening in, the, uh, in this particular space. So on the first one, when we look at integrating ESG, I think we are moving away from a situation where ESG is not only a standalone in a single department or a single uh, function. It is, it is widely across the organization and it's actually going deeper within the organization. And you will see that uh, companies are integrating this, you know, at, I would say, you know, at at the highest level in terms of at the board level, but then going down into senior management and then going into the various functional business units as well. And as part of this particular integration, what we are seeing is the, the growth and the manifestation of new sustainability models. There's a new thinking in terms of how do we look at ESG in our business? How are we, how are we managing uh, you know, the larger scope of ESG and how, but more importantly, how are we bringing ESG to the people within the organization? And hence this particular integration, as I said, is being wide, but also deepening, but it's also deepening within the organization. I think the next important point, and I'm sure you will agree as well, is that valuing human capital and this whole aspect around human rights, which is one of the other trends out there, has becoming, is becoming more and more of an important issue within the organization. And, and I think institutions, uh, profit and nonprofit, are starting to see the individual as a whole and not just as an employee. 
you know, and they are concentrating more on the well-being of the individual, but also focusing on the health and safety of that particular individual. And, and as a result, I mean, it is, it is a reflection of sustainability in the sense that, you know, you are looking at the long-term value of the individual in the organization, that he or she is not just a number, but they are part of the organization and that they make a huge contribution in the growth and development uh, of, of the business, but also contributing to, to profit planet uh, issues as well. So the business employee relationship, you know, or the dynamic has definitely changed. And this important trend has been clearly reflected in the S of ESNG as well. I think responding to climate change, many of you have already seen some of these huge and bold disclosures by some of the large tech companies, be, be they Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, uh, and you'll see the commitment to net zero, the commitment to carbon neutral, um, and a transition to a low carbon economy as well. So there's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of movement in this particular direction. And I think um, many institutions are starting to report on, I would say uh, specifically around how they're managing climate change, um, how they are reporting on the greenhouse gas emissions, for example, how are they managing their scope one, scope two, three emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So responding to climate change has becoming or is becoming a more and more pertinent issue as, uh, as ESG continues um, further. I think the next point is, and, and this relates very, very closely to SDG 17, when we talk about global partnerships, is that many companies are sort of rethinking their business models in terms of how they are working collaboratively, uh, either with their own peers, with the public sector, with other third party agencies, with, with with nonprofits, et cetera. And as, a, and as part of this, what you are seeing are new KPIs that are being developed. And these particular KPIs have been focused more on sustainability KPIs that are linked to some extent on the ESG criteria as well. You know, so again, I think gone are the days where we are, where we've been focused predominantly on, on, on shareholder capitalism, but focusing more and more now on stakeholder capitalism where, you know, people profit and the planet are becoming more and more important and critical issues as well. So the next part is, I just wanted to share with you what are some of the organizational issues or the performance or the performance issues that um, that people are seeing out there and and this is now all related to ESG data and due diligence that is being reported um, out there and I think what I am trying to showcase here is to talk about the environmental social governance due diligence data that is coming out and how this is changing the landscape and how this is, I would say, prompting institutions to do more in the sustainability scale, uh, uh, space as well. So when we look at some of the criteria that these institutions are using, um, you know, there is uh, again uh, the Global Reporting Initiative and under the Global Reporting Initiative, you will see there are these six buckets and under these six buckets, uh, companies are asked to, to provide their, their disclosure. And what companies are doing is looking at each of those particular six buckets and providing uh, their uh, reporting and disclosure on these issues. Similarly, I have also used the NASDAQ reporting guidelines um, when I used to work with some of my clients um, or, or um, sorry, uh, I've been using this for some of my clients in the sense of uh, the NASDAQ reporting guidelines provides a good framework, in my opinion, 
um, of, of saying, hey, what are some of those important environmental social governance issues that you should be looking at? And how are you reporting on those particular issues as well? And I just wanted to share here also that this is what is coming out of those particular disclosures. So from a very broad ESG issue, uh, disclosure perspective, you'll see these are ESG scores and the comparison of those ESG scores that are coming out from the rating and ranking agencies. So for example, you know, Sustainalytics, uh, uh, um, MSCI, and you will see that companies are now being, being scored against how they are performing on their ESG portfolios. And this is becoming an important, um, this is becoming more and more an important thing because you know, there's been some investor pressure on doing this, but then also there's been a lot of shareholder and I would say stakeholder activism to saying, hey, how are we managing these ESG and ESG scores? In addition to that, when we talked about the ESNG, uh, from a E perspective, you will see there is a lot of reporting now on your greenhouse gases, on your water, uh, on your uh, on your water uh, emission, um, on your water availability, uh, but then also what is the amount of renewable energy? Uh, be it wind, uh, solar, hydrogen, what are those renewable type of energy, energies that you are bringing in within uh, your organizations? So um, again, these are, this just gives a quick example of the environmental metrics out there and how companies are being rated against, against this as well. And, you know, it goes back to, are you reporting on these environmental social governance issues? How are you relating this back to these six buckets that we've just talked about as well? And this is what these, uh, these agencies are looking at uh, going forward. Um, again, on the social side, you will see there's been a huge emphasis you know, on health and safety, on, on, on supply chain uh, management, but more importantly, on, on human rights, specifically in the supply chain, for example. And then Lastly, you know, from a from a governance perspective, looking at you know equality, uh, looking at uh, women management, for example, on boards, for example, uh, independent uh, uh, chairpersons within your board of directors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So governance. So this just gives another quick example of of how companies are or how institutions are being rated based on the. Uh, governance um, scores as well. So the next part that I just wanted to briefly touch on is what is the roadmap? And what can be done, what can be done to accelerate, I would say, um, what can be done to accelerate sustainability within your institution? Uh, what can be done to increase the organizational performance when you look at purpose and growth within the organization. So very simply, this is a, a roadmap that, that we at ERM have been developing. And, and what we are saying is that, you know, an ESG strategy has multiple parts and it is a journey in many respects, you know. And it takes time. I mean, I understand it takes time, but you know, we have a 2030 agenda out there as part of the UN uh, 2030 agenda. And the point is, how do we improve? How do we accelerate this this sustainability um, landscape or the sustainability goals that we want to achieve? You know, and in some cases within the institutions, we are saying. You know, is that how do you how do you start with maybe doing a business case, and how does that particular business case have an alignment to the purpose of the organization? Uh, has a alignment to the purpose of the organization, and what are some of the ESG expectations within the organization? The next step is then understanding what are some of the key material issues that are important to the organization. You know, and 
um, how do you manage this by understanding the, the internal and the external landscape in terms of stakeholder management? And in some cases, uh, there's been uh, cases where a peer benchmarking has been done as well. You know, the next stage is once you have that is go into a reporting stage, you know, and get your company or institution aligned with a particular type of framework. And, you know, it could be a SASB, it could be a CDP, it could be a, uh, it could be a GRI type of framework. And most importantly, for me also, it's about what are some of those KPAs? What are some of those KPIs that you're putting in place? And then I think an important part of this process is also, you know, the target setting. Then also looking at, uh, for example, developing a short and long-term vision, but then also measuring and evaluating. But most importantly is how do you, how do you operationalize sustainability in the business? And how do you bring this to different parts within the organization and, and have that, as I uh, previously talked about, is providing the various business models or the new sustainability type of business models as you go. So I'm gonna end with a few conclusions here, uh, Lauren. And I think the point I want to bring out is that in order to accelerate company purpose, in order to grow sustainability in the organization, you know, it cannot be done alone. I think it starts with a common agenda and that particular common agenda is what is it that we are trying to seek? What is it that we are trying to achieve? And what, is, what are some of the goals that we're setting for ourselves on a year by year basis? What is the baseline that we set for ourselves and how are we measuring ourselves on a year by year basis uh, on, a, on a year by year basis based on that particular baseline so the point i'm making here is that in order for in order for that particular impact to happen there needs to be a collective working together you know and i think it in many ways it's about you know having an adaptive and a technical problem solving mindset. And as you and I know, there are no silver bullets, you know, uh, and it's a, and it can be a time consuming process, but it can be a very, very rewarding process, I think, at the end of the day. And um, maybe you've seen this or not, but I really like this, this um, working with complexity uh, model by, by Nostra. You know, and he talks about if you have a vision, if you have skills, if you have incentives, resources, and action plan in place, hey, you might have success, right? And if you're missing each one of those, so for example, if you're probably missing the action plan, then you might have some false starts. If you're missing resources, you might leave, there might be added frustration in the business, for example. If you have incentives that are missing, that there might be some resistance, you know, within the organization. Um, if skills are missing, you know, they might, this might lead to increased anxiety. But most importantly, if there isn't that sustainability vision, there is confusion. You know, so, so that I believe needs to be very clear in terms of day one, in terms of what is that sustainability vision? What is the mission around it? And how are you imparting that to different parts in the organization as well? I think it's about, for me personally, I think it's about changing mindsets. And how do we, how do we go about doing that? I think, you know, I think there's an understanding, yes, you know, it's a, it's a complex challenge. Um, the environment in some cases is unknown. Uh, it, it can, in some cases, become capital intensive, um, you know, and there might be different agendas, both from shareholders and as well as stakeholders. But what I am proposing here is how do you move more to a collaborative mindset and what does that particular and what does that particular collaborative mindset look like? You know, is about, as I said, collectively working together. How do you weigh the pros and cons of issues? Uh, the ability to, to really, really integrate ESG in your business. But then also, you know, building up the skill space within the organization. For example, you know, looking at reuse. Um, reduce recycling initiatives within the organization, for example, and how, how do you develop 
a policy around that? How do you develop skills in terms of managing, in terms of managing that um, uh, within the organization, but also making sure that you have a target by saying, hey, maybe by 2025, these are some of the areas within the organization that would be that we'd be uh, reusing or recycling for that matter. So this is, I'm almost done, Lauren. Uh, just a, a final one or two slides here. I think, um, as I see, it, this is sort of the, the changing face of sustainability. Um, I think both public and private companies are increasingly promoting sustainability in the ESG performance. And I, and I, and I strongly believe it, sustainability is here to stay, whether you like it or not. Um, and the ESG ecosystem that I shared on a previous slide is, is growing. I mean, we are already seeing huge fundamental changes that are currently taking place in Europe already. And I think there are lessons that we are learning from, from Europe as well in terms of uh, through the EU Green Deal, how they managing their own sustainability initiatives. Um, and again, the, the mindset again is moving from a very strong traditional mindset to a new emerging normal mindset, I think. Um, as normal, as normal, as normal as you want it to be, you know. But I think it's it's sort of moving from pleasing shareholders to the growing importance of stakeholders and understanding who those stakeholders are within the organization. But more importantly, also looking at who are those non-contracted stakeholders, for example, who are people within the supply chain, for, for example, as well. And Yes, traditional, in the traditional sense, you know, profit was the primary purpose, but I think as, um, as we've seen, uh, you know, people, profit and planet, um, you know, is becoming more and more, more, becoming more and more important, as you know. And again, you saw the, the ladder that we talked about in terms of from a simple CSR, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility ladder to now focusing more on actually embedding sustainability within the organization and then moving from reuse and recycling to more circular and regenerative type of thinking, but also practices within our respective organizations. Lauren, thank you very much. I will stop there. Ooh, take a breath. That was amazing. Um, I always learned so much from you, Natasha, and I'm so grateful for your time, time and time again, that you spend with Actera. We have some great questions, so I want to make sure um, that we have time to go through those. Are you prepared for me to throw some questions at you? Okay. Um, so the first question, uh, which may be the very most important, is are you willing to connect with people on LinkedIn? Yes, for sure. Okay. So I will make sure that when I send out the, the recording um, and the notes from today that I will include Natasha's LinkedIn profile so you can connect with him at will. That's a great question. Um, another question is from an anonymous attendee, an ESG disclosure requirements and pressure continues to grow. How does this affect fossil fuel companies? Are they starting to adapt to changing values? Why or why not? That's a great question. Thank you. I think um, fossil fuel companies are definitely changing and they are emerging as being very strong contenders in terms of how they are managing their own sustainability spaces. I think a lot of them are moving away from large scale, um, from large scale, I would say a gas to electric initiatives. I think a lot of them have moved into sort of the green space in terms of managing their own environmental issues by creating collaborative networks, for example, with solar companies, with wind companies, with renewable fuels companies. And a particular example of this is a company called Engie, E-N-G-I-E. -G -G and if you look them up, you will see as a traditional utility that was focused, you know, predominantly in the gas sector, you'll see the transformative changes that they've, that they've actually uh, had to undergo. And this was done intentionally because they, they themselves realized, you know, that in order for them to mature in a non-fossil fuel environment, they had to adapt and make those changes. They had to make those investments in, in the EV sector, for example, in the power transmission sector, 
you know so i think a lot of the oil and gas companies the a lot of the oil and gas companies uh i would say you know going going the extra breath in terms of trying to focus on how they can change their own landscape there might be a few that are still struggling i think some of the coal companies are still having a you know a hard time you know in terms of how they're making the transition um and and there's a double whammy for them because most importantly it's also a huge greenhouse greenhouse gas issue you know so i think they are finding ways in terms of how they can work better with institutions out there as well in terms of reducing their own greenhouse gases by by finding innovative ways of you know reducing or recycling initiatives in house as well yeah uh, thank you for that. Um, we have another anonymous question. Even if big tech companies create a well-framed ESG framework, is it still possible that this isn't doing enough on their climate commitments? You addressed this a little bit in your last answer, you know, and how everything is shifting. And um, is that roadmap going to work fast enough to make an impact before we go past climate tipping points? I think that's a firstly thank you for the question and I think it's an important question because it is not just the responsibility of of the institution but it is the responsibility of the individuals and the communities around that institution to bring about that change and I think it's important to to clearly state that when we look at some of those key practices in, and, and the guidelines that are being set within some of those institutions, what I'm seeing more and more over is that it takes, it takes a level of awareness and skill building and learning and education to bring people up to speed as to what needs to be done. You know, so again, it is not a silo mentality approach you know, but it is very much more a company wide initiative. You know, so to answer that particular question, I think, you know, it is not only, you know, uh, that particular institution that is responding, but it's a peer group of institutions that are putting pressure on themselves as well in terms of how they can manage the ESG disclosure landscape better. Mm -hmm. That leads into the next question around um, the definitions and criteria. How do enterprises and rating agencies handle those moving targets uh, when it comes to definitions or criteria to make um, and get ESG more comprehensive? I think to answer your question there, Lauren, is that it is an evolving landscape. And when I say evolving landscape, if I look at some of the material issues that are important to an organization today, they might be slightly different in the next, in the next year, right? So the idea would be is if you want to make sure that you are keeping up with what are the important issues that you as an institution are facing or that would have an impact on the institution, it would be important to do a materiality assessment every year. Hmm. And in that way, I think you would be, I would say, above the curve in terms of saying, hey, this is what our shareholders are saying. This is what our stakeholders are saying. This is what is coming up in our supply chain, you know. Uh, and I think through that, there would be a better understanding in terms of saying, we need to look at the, these particular disclosures on the environmental side. We need to looking, we need to start looking at maybe um, core issues around uh, labor safety or human rights of a different kind in a particular industry, for example. You know, so again, it is a trends analysis. It is criteria that will change on a year by year basis. So it's a very, in my opinion, a evolving landscape that needs to be looked at, I would say at least once a year. And by doing that, you are also making sure that you are looking at the material issues that are affecting the company in the short, medium, long term, but also providing 
that disclosure that is correct and accurate based on the, based on your material issues uh, that you currently have in front of you. In follow-up to that, which is not a question in the chat, but do you feel like these companies are willing to do that level of investment and that level of reflection on an annual basis, or is that asking too much at this point? Well, I I hope that they are doing it uh, for their own sake if they want to keep their share price up, <laughs> right? Well, that's, I, I mean, that's a perfect segue because one of the questions from Amanda is what is the monetary value proposition for the industry to make this investment? And in the ESG transparency, what efficacy and cost savings do they bring? Um, so that leads into that question. Uh, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good segue and a good question too, I think, because I think the world, in my opinion, is moving 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 in a direction where conscious capitalism is is becoming an important theme and this particular conscious capitalism is saying that yes profit is important right but accompanying profit how are you providing a better working environment for your for your employees right what is it that you're doing to keep this particular planet healthier and safer. And, and, and as a direct reflection of this as well, Lauren, what I'm seeing is that many companies are, are looking at a triple bottom line type of measurement, right? And um, the, the B Corps of the world is a true testament of this as well. You know, I mean, large institutions like Patagonia, like um, Unilever and Ben and Jerry's, you know, I mean, these are huge institutions that didn't have to become B Corps, but they are, right? And it shows a very strong commitment on their part that's saying, yes, hey, you know, we have a strong focus on our own profitability, but we have other issues that are also important that we need to start considering. And, you know, and as part of this sort of conscious capitalism piece, I think. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of institutions are starting to pay lots more attention, not specifically, I would say, on the E part, because that has been a growing element, but more on the social and the governance part of, uh, of ESMG. Yeah. So interesting. And we all know the level of investment that these things need, and we see people struggling all the time for that. One of the questions from Wendy on our staff um, relates to the Nostra model and what happens to be missing most often from that in your experience, um, which could be what's missing in investment, right, that you see most common. So from the model that you showed us, what are you seeing is, is missing most often in your work? That's a good question. Um, I think for me, what is missing is... Um, And it's actually on either spectrum. It's either the vision is missing or the action plan is missing. <laughs> Both of which are very important. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, what I am seeing also is that companies are focusing on understanding the purpose and the why of why is it that we're doing this? Why should we be doing this? You know, and that goes into translating into, into some extent, you know, the purpose, the mission and the vision. And it should not just be a corporate alignment, but it should be a very strong sustainability alignment to that as well. You know, organizations like Actera or the work that you do in continuation to Wendy's question fill the gap for them? How do, we, how do we help support companies in giving them the resources? How do they find their own resources to fill those gaps from their own mm -hmm. model? Yeah, I think an important part of that, Lauren, is how do you provide that level of awareness, but also the skills, education, and training that goes with that? You know, I think for me, it's, it's an element that to some extent is missing. Right. And the other element I think related to that also is, and this is the nature of our world, is 
how would you be incentivized to get things done, right? Is it going to be linked to your performance scorecard at the end of the day, right? And the point is, how do you start implementing some of those issues as well? The flip side of that, and we have two questions related to this are, um, as individuals, what can we be doing to get into the space? What are good certificates? How do we get into sustainability consulting? What has your, your experience been in the wide spectrum of work that you've done around getting into this field and what is required of you as an individual to have impact? Yeah, I think they are, um, firstly, Lauren, thanks for the question. I think uh, but the point is that you need to, I think it's about initiative and where your interest lies, right? If you have a very strong, I would say, environmental initiative, you know, you want to probably look at saying, hey, are there specific areas around carbon disclosure or greenhouse gas issues? If you are passionate around maybe specific issues around water, right? Looking at water conservation or alternative water reuse. My, my experience is telling me is that you need to just, just join an organization, join an institution that is heavily focused or is focused on one or two of those issues. Um, get involved maybe on a voluntary basis, understand that landscape a bit better, and then start maybe getting involved in a few training training, trainings around it. I mean, there is a huge amount of training, for example, in the circularity in the reuse space, for example, you know, in the recycling space. If that's, for example, an area that you're interested in, you know, join an organization, go and read up, um, join, for example, a, uh, a working group that is talking about that, you know, um, write a paper, for example, you know, share your thoughts, you know. Um, so I think there are, there are definitely different ways and multiple ways uh, to do that, you know, and, you know, go out there and, and just, and become your own thought leader. That's what I was saying, you know, is, is that you can become your own thought leader in a particular area and, and shape, shape, shape the, the decisions, the direction of that particular area that you focus in. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's empowering, particularly when we can feel a little defeated around climate change issues to begin with. So that's, yeah, that's great, thank you. Larry, mm. comment to the panelists about a book that he read called The Sustainability Handbook. So that seems like it's a good way mm. to that individual learning in. And then um, one of the questions mentioned in MBA and Actera partners with Presidio Graduate School. Yep and they have sustainability MBAs, um, among other things, certificates. And we always put people to Presidio because they've been such a great partner of ours. We have two final questions. Mm. Um, one, acknowledging the great presentation. Thanks, Natesh. Thank and wanting more thoughts on SMEs, adaptation to climate change. Yeah. I think that is becoming a more and more important issue, especially as I am seeing the SME within the supply chain. I think um, there is going to be a lot of pressure that's going to be put on the SMEs in terms of how they are accounting for their climate change initiatives. I think there's a lot of support out there from various institutions in terms of helping them in terms of looking at climate change scenarios and scenario management, helping them doing, helping them with some benchmark analysis, uh, providing some feedback in terms of how they can manage their own ratings and rankings. Um, and then also providing some guidance in terms of what are some best practices from a social and governance perspective, not only environmental as well. You know, so it is, it is a landscape that is growing and changing. And I think, you know, down the line, um, 
some very large companies might also start putting some budget allocations mm. for people within their supply chain because they themselves want to see the growth of the SMEs in their supply chain. So another thing that I would ask SMEs to, to look out for is to reach out to some of the companies that you're working with, right? Um, understand their supplier base, understand the other suppliers in that supplier base and see what they're doing. You know, there might be some cross-pollination, there might be some best practice that you can adapt. You know, so again, it's about maybe just reaching out and and asking for help, I think, in some cases, you know, you. It's it's understandable, you know, you've got a business as an as an SME, as an SME or or as an SMME, you know, uh, you have a business to run. What's the extra M mean for those listening? Uh, it's a small, medium, micro enterprise. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so it, we're at time, but we have one last question. So for those of you that would like to stay, you're absolutely welcome to. But um, the last question is, how do you see the SDGs being integrated into business, education, government, thinking whole system wide? You've talked a lot about ESG today, too. So, so how does the SDGs get incorporated into those aspects? Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I think in many, many ways, for me, the SDGs have been the, a very strong foundation. It has been a very strong framework on which to base your sustainability. And I would encourage people to actually look at the 17 SDGs, go to the UN sustainability, go to the UN SDGs website, look at each of those particular SDGs, you know, each of those SDGs have specific targets, they have specific goals, but more importantly, you will also see the type of initiatives and activities that government institutions, companies, nonprofit organizations are putting emphasis on the programs and initiatives around those SDGs. So I think there's a very strong complementarity of service when I say service offerings, I talk about um, I talk about you know at a higher level the SDG framework, but then breaking that up into smaller ESG initiatives. You know, so you look at the SDGs and how do you how do you cluster them within your organization to make them simpler into maybe four or five buckets, and those four or five buckets could be Again, environmental, social governance, economic issues, for example. Right. But I think a lot of companies are looking at 2030. And that is why the UN has said, and putting a very strong focus to, to individuals, organizations, and institutions to saying, we need to do more to meet the 2030 sustainable development agenda. What is it that you're doing? So there's a lot of pressure, I think, by just by just by looking at those SDGs, at the targets and the goals that have been set in those SDGs, and how are institutions working towards achieving that? You know, so so the pressure is on, Lord. Yep. <laughs> I know. I mean, Actera, we talk all the time about 2030, right? I mean, we've got a nine-year headway for those of you that came to our promise to the planet. Bill McKibben spoke very clearly about 2030. This is even in our own programs and the conversations. Um, Nitesh, thank you so much as always for your continued support and just the amazing work you're doing and supporting the organizations that you're supporting towards these goals. For everyone that attended, thank you. There's some uh, new names and some regulars that came today. I'm so glad to see all of you listed. I'm glad we got through all the questions too. I'll make sure to send all of this to you um, in the follow-up email just to share again, we had two upcoming events. We have a GoEV workshop on June 9th, and we have a financial incentives clinic on June 16th. So please make sure to attend those. If you're able, register through actera.org slash events. And we will see you again for the fall lecture series, which we will be focusing on 
EVs, EV technology, and the future of uh, mobility when it comes to electrifying. Natesh, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you. Have a great day. Lauren, thank you for having me, and I wish you well. Thank you again. Huh? Thanks, Take care. Thanks to participants Bye. as well. Bye now.